start the first session of the second day of this uh, program. Uh, first, we have a second lecture by Vadim. And uh, yeah, he is going to talk about the general beta and the matrix theory. And as you may have noticed uh, on the website, there are lecture notes for this second lecture and also problem set. And of course, uh, and also we have already put the video video for the first lecture. So yeah, if you want to review the first part, you can do that after afterwards. Okay, so there's some chat. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, 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 okay. I just sent a link to, to the website. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, so let's resume. So please start, Vadim. Okay, thanks for everyone for coming. So we are starting our second lecture. So let me remind you what we reached last time. So that's our roadmap. So we discussed uh, corners of beta random matrices. And today we are switching to sums of beta random matrices. So that will be the main topic for us so today to make sense. What does it mean to add two matrices when you know the dimension of the field is beta, so there is non-existent field in the background. So let's uh, let's do a quick recap. So what we found last time, so we studied this operation of cutting corners from a matrix. And uh, so we understood that uh, you can make sense of this operation for any values of parameter beta. At beta equals one, two, and four, these are real complex of quaternionic matrices. And now a general beta, what you say that if you look at the joint distribution of eigenvalues of corners of n times n matrix, then all these eigenvalues should necessarily be interlacing and their joint law so definition is given by this formula here, which extrapolates uh, the formula for the joint law at beta equals one, two, and four, which we you know, almost proved. And you know, if you follow the homework, then you can produce full proof for this statement. And now we go, now we're doing next step. So now we want to do more complicated operation than just cutting corners, namely addition of matrices. So in order to present some general idea, general approach to addition of matrices, it's good to start from a toy question. So the toy question is, how do you really add random variables? There should definitely can be very different points of view how you add random variables. Let me give you one point of view. So let's take independent, independent random variables A and B random variables A and B. So we want to make sense of their sum. So how do you think about their sum? So there are different points of view on that. And uh, what, I, what I suggest to take a look at, I suggest to take a look at the Fourier view on this. So Fourier point of view, Fourier point of view. It suggests to think about random variables through their characteristic functions. So the through characteristic functions. So what does it mean through characteristic functions? It means that uh, when you have a random variable A, then instead of this random variable, what you consider is a function. So that was random variable A, and you can replace this random then random variable by function, which is given by expectation of exponent i t a, and it is a function of real argument. So there's a complex function of real argument t. And now, as soon as you know this function, you can reconstruct distribution of random variable A. So if you use something you know, like inverse Fourier transform, then you can uniquely reconstruct your distribution. So distribution of A is reconstructed by inverse Fourier. Okay, so now this gives rise to the following 
quite straightforward theorem, theorem which will be a basis for our generalization to addition of random matrices. So you can say that the distribution of C, distribution of C, which we want to define it as a sum of C is uniquely determined by the following identity, by the identity that expectation of E I exponent of I T C is equal to the expectation of E to the I T A multiplied by expectation of E to the I T B. And this identity should be valid for all real values of T. So in this identity, this expectation is something that we know because we are given A. So we know this thing. This expectation is something that we also know. And if you know two functions, then we definitely also know their product. And the claim is that their product, that's something which defines your distribution of C. So proof is quite straightforward here. Proof, well, first of all, the identity is true that expectation of ITA times expectation of ITB is equal to expectation of ITC. Whether well, this is simply, you know, if we choose C equal to A plus B, then because of the independence, uh, you know, expectations factorize, and that's how you get that it is true. So independence, independence of A and B imply that identity is true for C is equal to A plus B. And on the other hand, this uniqueness theorem, which I stated here, so that random variables are by bijective correspondence with their characteristic function. So uniqueness theorem implies that C is actually you know, the only distribution which, which would satisfy that. So uniqueness theorem for these characteristic functions, well, implies that no other law satisfies the same identity. No other law satisfies, well, this identity. And that's why, you know, this identity uniquely fixes the distribution of C. And that's precisely, you know, what is being claimed in this theorem. Now, what is the consequence of this theorem? So the consequence is a little bit philosophical. So let's state it as a conclusion. So to compute the law of the sum, what you do not need to know, do not need, so you do not need to know what the sign plus means. So it's not necessary, meaning of plus. You do not need to know the meaning of independence. You know, independence, that's a quite complicated notion from probability theory. So you need to deal with, you know, sigma algebras, various properties of this thing. But, you know, to compute the law of the sum, you don't need all that. So you don't need meaning of independence. But, you know, all you need in order to understand this operation is just, you know, being able to multiply two functions, right? So need just multiplication of characteristic functions. Multiplication of characteristic functions. So somehow all information is encoded in these characteristic functions and this operation of multiplication on the functions gives rise to operation on random variables. Okay. So that's kind of philosophical principle which we are going to adapt for working with sums of beta random matrices. We'll try to kind of repeat the same kind of argument, but now for addition of beta random matrices. So let's uh, start from the classical values of beta where really there is a true matrix. So beta equals one, two, and four. So now we're adapting this principle from uh, independent random variables and now we're using it you know, for matrices. So here's a theorem. It tells that if you are adding two 
and time sense, self adjoint independent matrices A and B. So C is their sum. Then the law of this sum is uniquely determined by the following identity that the expectation of the exponent of I times trace C times Z, where C is what plays role of the variable T, which was present in the characteristic functions before, should uh, be able to, you know, should be able to compute it as a product of expectation of the similar expression for A and expectation for similar expression of B. And you should treat these as identity of functions in variable Z, where Z is a self-adjoint matrix. So if this identity is true for all matrices Z, then it uniquely fixes the law of the sum C. Okay, so let's try to figure out why that is true. Okay, first, if you take C equal to A plus B, then identity is true. Well, that is simply because uh, trace of CZ is equal to trace of AZ plus trace of BZ. Well, trace is linear, multiplication is linear, so that's a straightforward identity. So, you know, trace of expectation of the I trace CZ, it's a product of expectations of I to trace of this thing, I to trace of this thing, and now because of the independence, expectation of the product splits into products of expectations. So that is really true for, for, your, for your matrix C. Now, you know, the next question, why is this identity uniquely fixing the law of C? So that is because, well, that will be second step. That's because actually this trace is not a very complicated thing. So namely, you know, what is trace CZ actually? This is just a sum over all I and J of C I J times Z J I. So you see that there is really just, you know, you have a parameter per matrix element and you just, you know, multiply C's by the Z's and sum it up. So it's really the same type of expression as you have in characteristic functions. So the conclusion is that this is just a usual multidimensional characteristic function or multidimensional Fourier transform. The, the usual multidimensional multidimensional characteristic function or Fourier transform. Well, if it is still Fourier transform, then the same inversion theorem is valid here. You can still use like inverse Fourier transform, whatever you prefer. It just, you know, this Fourier transform in Euclidean space, Euclidean space of n times n Hermitian matrices. Maybe it's better to say self-adjoint matrices. And that's why there is again the uniqueness theorem just exactly the same way as n equals to one. There is uniqueness like for n equals to one. Okay, so that's an important theorem. So it says that you can think about adding matrices in terms of these expectations of the exponents of traces. Any questions about this statement? Okay, so this is a statement which we want to generalize. So we need to, you know, as we previously figure out when studying corners, somehow, you know, we want to get rid of eigenvectors eventually. So we will try to transform this identity a little bit. So we will, re we'll we will do several reductions for this identity and then we will be able to do general beta extension. So first let's reduce to eigenvalues. And this is maybe the main definition of this lecture. So this is definition of so-called multivariate Bessel function, which does 
reduction to eigenvalues here. So we want to compute these expectations, you know, these, these are important objects for us, expectation of i times trace az. Now we won't be able to nicely compute it for arbitrary matrices of A, so we now need to assume something about those. And as I was mentioning in the previous lecture, our current theory ignores completely eigenvectors. There is really a theory about eigenvalues. That's why, you know, for matrix A, we will choose a matrix which has some fixed eigenvalues, but then uniformly random eigenvectors, which means that they invariant under conjugations by, you know, unitary orthogonal matrices, depending on which field you work. Now, important statement is that the law of this trace of the product, trace AZ, Actually, it doesn't depend on the, on the full matrix Z. In fact, it only depends on eigenvalues of Z. So only not on the like, you know, N squared size matrix, so N times N matrix, but instead only on the N real numbers, which are N eigenvalues of your matrix. And we will denote this resulting function of N eigenvalues, you know, through B. So this B it depends on A1 to AN, Okay, Z is eight parameters, so it's convenient to do slighter normalization by multiplying them by I. And this is this expectation of the exponent of the trace for which A is the just eigenvalues of this matrix A and eigenvectors are uniformly random. So there is some statement here, right? So that is a, it's both definition and the theorem because it defines this multivariate Bessel function through this identity, beta is equal one, two, or four here now. And simultaneously, you know, in order for this definition to make sense, you need to know that the right-hand side indeed only, you know, depends on eigenvalues. So let's prove that indeed it only depends to eigenvalues. So in the right-hand side, you need to assume something about Z. So Z is assumed, well, depending on your preferences, you can assume that it's self-adjoint to be self-adjoint. But actually, you know, you can assume it to be a little bit more general. You can assume that it is a normal matrix. And normal, this means that it's commuting with this uh, transpose conjugate. So in both situations, why do you need that it's either self-adjoint or normal? Well, in both cases, it can be diagonalized by orthogonal or unitary transformations. So in both cases, can be diagonalized, diagonalized. In other words, so you can write that Z is equal to U times diagonal matrix times U star and U, well, that is either unitary if you work on the complex field or maybe orthogonal if you We'll work on the real field. So you can conjugate matrix to make it diagonal. Okay, now if you have this form for your Z, then, then you can write that trace of AZ. So what is it? So we plug in. So that is a trace of U times Z1, ZN. Oh, A is missing. So it's trace. A, U, Z1, Zn, 0, 0, U star. Now a little bit of tricks here. So first we will move U star to the left. So you'll say that there is a trace of U star A, U, Z1, Zn. This is just because trace of the product of two matrices does not depend on the order in which you are multiplying these two matrices. So you can do this. Now the next trick is to notice that actually this is equal in distribution to the trace of A Z1 Zn. So why is that? Well that's because by the definition, the law of A was invariant under conjugations, right? We fixed eigenvalues for this matrix A, but we were not saying anything about eigenvectors. So they were kind of sampled uniformly at random. So when you do another conjugation, there is still the same uniformly random matrix with, uh, you know, fixed eigenvalues. So, you know, we can remove U from here. Once you have that, that's not hard to compute the trace. So that is just a sum 
I go from one to n of a i i multiplied by z i. So actually, you know, all you need to know, conclusion is that all you need to know is actually diagonal elements of your matrix A, and these diagonal elements are multiplied by eigenvalues Zs and nothing else. So, you know, the conclusion is that indeed your expectation depends only on eigenvalues. So expectation of E to the I trace AZ depends only on z1, zn. And therefore you can, you know, just say, okay, that is a function of these eigenvalues and that's by definition, that is our multivariate Bessel function. Okay, good. Any questions about this computation? Okay, if no, then uh, now I will give you another definition of multivariate Bessel function because in this definition, it's still unclear how do you extend to general values of beta. It still, you know, relies on computing expectation of the trace of a matrix, so you need to have a true matrix. Now here's another definition which now does not depend on the existence of the matrix. So these definitions is in terms of the corners process, which we introduced and studied in the last lecture. So the corners process, you know, this cut in the corners plays role for addition of matrices as well. So here's a definition. So now beta can be any, anything, so any real number, maybe positive. You are saying that this multivariate Bessel function still parameterized by the same n tuple of real numbers. Now, depending on this parameter beta over two n, there's a function of n, maybe complex numbers or real, whatever you prefer. It's defined in terms of the corners process. So you take this law that we developed last time. So you fix eigenvalues on the top and you consider this law of the corners of the matrix, eigenvalues of the corners. So this is like, you know, random, interlacing array of eigenvalues. And now in this random interlacing array, you compute certain expectation. So what's written here? So there's expectation of exponent of sum of Z case times sum on the kth row minus sum of the K minus first row, or maybe level, maybe that's better to say it like that. In other words, that is, characteristic function or maybe Laplace transform, your terminology you prefer, of the differences between sums along the rows, which you treat as random variables. And okay, so for each value of beta, we have this array, you know, we had this density on the first slide today, and you can define this random variable and you can define, you know, this function. So that is the second definition of this multivariate Bessel function, which now makes sense for each beta positive. Now, of course, you know, these are two definitions which presumably should match at beta equals one, two, and four. So that is our next proposition that in fact, you know, that is exactly the same thing. So if at beta equals one, two, and four, we are not really doing something new. We're just re-expressing, you know, the same function in two different ways. So, you know, how do you do that? So we showed just two slides ago, two slides ago, that this trace, which is appearing here, it's easily computable. It's expectation of E to the I trace AZ, in fact, is expectation of E to the I sum a i i, uh, maybe it's better to have k k because that's notation there. Sum k goes one to n, a k k z k. Now I claim that that's precisely the same expression as the one on top because what is a k k? You can write that a k k is a trace of k times k corner minus trace of k minus one times k minus one corner. So here is a picture, you have your matrix, you have k times k corner, k minus one times k minus one corner. And okay, so how is the trace different? Trace is just some of the diagonal matrix elements. So when you subtract the trace for a little bit larger matrix minus trace for a little bit smaller matrix, that's 
That's what you are getting. And then, okay, in addition to compute and trace as a sum of diagonal elements, there is another way how to compute and trace it is simultaneously sum of the eigenvalues. And eigenvalues, these are precisely our xi case. So this is also equal to sum, I go to one to n, k x i k minus sum to one to k minus one x i k minus one. So these are just eigenvalues of these corners. Eigenvalues. <clears throat> okay, good. So now, you know, we have definition of this Bessel function. We have match with these uh, expectations. And now this means that we are now ready for our main definition of this lecture. So definition. So given some deterministic eigenvalues, a i, i goes one to n, b i, i goes one to n. We define random eigenvalues of c i's about which, you know, the way to think about that we think about those as eigenvalues of the sum of independent beta matrices with uniformly random eigenvectors and with these fixed prescribed eigenvalues. We define them through this identity, that expectation of this multivariate Bessel function. In this expectation, what is random? So this C is there being random here. So that is expectation with respect to C's. So this expectation should be equal to the product of Bessel functions in A's and in B's. And beta is fixed here and these are parameters. So that is something, so this identity is something which should be valid for all values of z's. And the notation that we are going to use is that c is given by this kind of fancy looking sum with the lower subscript beta of a and b. Now at beta equals one, two or four, really nothing happened because it is the same exactly thing which we had, you know, two slides, uh, maybe three slides before that we had this identity that, you know, expectation of exponent of the trace is equal to expectation of exponent of the trace time expectation of the exponent of the trace just rewritten in terms of, it for, of our new notations. But now, you know, this thing actually makes sense for any value of beta. And now you can say that that's an addition of matrices at values at any values of beta. Now, of course, not everything is so simple here. So there is a one tricky point here. Namely, you know, what you need to show here, you need to demonstrate that indeed there exists a probability measure on n tuples of real numbers such that this identity would be true. In other words, you need to produce some procedure which would be similar to maybe inverse Fourier transform. Okay, you can do this procedure here, but then you need to make sure that the result of applying this procedure to this product of two multivariate Bessel functions indeed will give you a probability measure. So what is known in the literature about that? So what is known is that this object kind of probability measure defining C's is well defined in the sense of being a generalized function or distribution. So you can compute, you know, values of this object, its pairings with various test functions that are always going to have numbers, you know, at these pairings. However, you know that, you know, not every generalized function, not every distribution is given by a probability measure. There's some special property, some kind of positivity of the generalized function. And this thing, you know, outside beta equals one, two, and four is actually an open problem. So this positivity is, you know, widely expected, but formally it was never proven. Now, you know, there are, I know that there are many people in the audience who know a lot about, you know, symmetric polynomials. So in the word of symmetric polynomial, the statement which would imply this positivity is the following wise. So you take two McDonald polynomials and you multiply those, you get a new symmetric polynomial and you re-expand back in the basis of McDonald polynomial. And you want to know that the coefficients which you get in this re-expansion, that they are positive. So essentially what we are doing is very similar to that, only instead of McDonald polynomials, we multiply and okay, these multivariate Bessel functions, but they're really close relatives. One can be obtained for another. So if we knew these positive formulas for the 
multiplication of the polynomial, then we will be done. So unfortunately, you know, there exists some formulas in the literature on how you compute, you know, expansion for the product, but they're, you know, too complicated that it's completely non-obvious that uh, the result is given by something positive. So for example, for, you know, sure function, there are simple combinatorial formulas, which is clear, but for McDonald's formulas, at this moment, the formulas are complicated enough so that, you know, this remains unclear. Okay, for us, that's maybe not so important, you know, okay, we don't know about this positivity, but okay, we believe in that, so we can work with this operation even without knowing that it is a positive operation. And that's what we are going to do here. Any questions about, you know, this definition? Okay, let's maybe demonstrate some examples because maybe that's a complicated definition. So let me show you that at least for n equals to one, nothing too scary is happening here. So what is n equals to one multivariate Bessel function? Multivariate Bessel function. Okay, let's try to compute it. Bessel function, so now it depends on one parameter and a variable this is our beta parameter. So by definition, it should be given by expectation of e to the z x11. Now what is x11? Okay, we have a kind of triangular array, but it's kind of very boring the deterministic triangular array because the top row is fixed and there is only one row. So this is actually equal to a. So, you know, this is expectation of something deterministic. So this multivariate Bessel function in the situation when x equal to one is just equal to the exponent. It's kind of in the world of symmetric polynomial, there's just a statement that, okay, if you deal with symmetric polynomials in one variable, then, you know, there's nothing interesting there. There are only monomials, you know, you can't come up with non-trivial theory, you know, in one variable. Okay, so this means that now if we use our definition, we are saying that C equal to A plus B, you know, sum of one times one matrices should be fixed by the following identity determined by expectation respect to C e to the ZC is equal to expectation or uh, to the e to the ZA multiplied e to the ZB. Okay, now that's my question to the audience to check whether some people are not sleeping yet. So, C is a random variable. A are two numbers, just deterministic numbers, maybe five and six. So what should be C as a random variable in order to have this identity holding true for all Z? So for what random variable C satisfies this identity? You can write in chat. <laughs> Anybody knows? I would say uh, Dirac Delta. Yeah, so that is just, you know, you don't need any randomness here, right? So complete the deterministic thing. You just take C to be deterministic, deterministic, a plus B. So at 10 equals to one, that is, you know, very boring cooperation. It is just usual addition. So we're really, you know, not getting any more generality. It's just, you know, we spent lots of time and we just redefine, you know, addition of numbers in a fancy way. And the reason for that is that, you know, when you deal with one times one matrices, you know, there is not much that eigenvectors are given to us. So one times one matrix, you know, doesn't have non-trivial eigenvectors. Non-trivial eigenvectors. So, you know, the all, you know, complication and, you know, interest in this operation comes from the interaction between eigenvectors of two independent matrices. So at 10 equals to one, okay, there is nothing like that. So, you know, that is just the usual operation of addition. 
Okay, so if we want to deal with larger values of n, then you know we need to understand something about these multivariate Bessel functions. Because as I told you, you know, in order to understand addition of matrices, you need to understand how do you multiply these multivariate Bessel functions. So, you know, unfortunately, outside beta equals to two, there are no particularly simple and easy to understand formulas. There are no explicit formulas for these things. Well, more explicit than expectations, which we used in their definition. So at beta equals to two, there are nice formulas and that will be given in the problem set. So there is a relatively straightforward computation, which gives a formula for these multivariate functions. But still, you know, even without formulas, you can develop some ways to think about them. Well, the first very important property is that actually they're symmetric in Z's. So uh, noted that this was very far from being obvious from the definition. So where was our thing? So that was a thing. So, you know, it was expectation of something which was computing, you know, characteristic function of these differences of the sums, right? And, you know, symmetry was very non-obvious here because it seems that, okay, on the first level you have only one random variable. Okay, maybe on the nth level you have actually, you know, well, maybe here you have n minus one random variable for which you compute in the sum, but somehow that is kind of the same thing. So, you know, there is a symmetry. So in distribution, you know, the law of each difference between two rows actually is the same. So that is somewhat mysterious property. Now, if you have, you know, this identity, then of course it's not mysterious at beta equals one, two, and four, because we figure out that, okay, this trace depends only on the eigenvalues of the matrix and eigenvalues, you know, they're not ordered. So you can't say which one is the first, which one is the second. So, you know, that's why this function must be, you know, symmetric, but actually, you know, this property still survives at any values of beta. So this is kind of easy from definition at beta equals one, two, and four, but, you know, needs proof. Needs a proof at general beta positive. And actually, I don't know particularly simple proofs. So the proofs that I know are quite complicated. There might be some direct proof, but you know, I don't know some direct easy proof of you know, this symmetry. Now, you know, one way to think about these functions is that if you know symmetric polynomials, then these are limits of Jack or McDonald symmetric polynomials. What kind of limits that might be simplest to see uh, in n equals to one case? So in n equals to one case, we deal with exponents as we figure out and exponents, okay, they are limits of polynomials. So exponent of the AZ can be obtained as a limit of one plus Z divided by M raised to the power MA as M, you know, integer going to infinity. And so, you know, that's a polynomial and that's a limit, some scaling limit of this polynomial, that's an exponent. Something similar is happening for any N. So there is a rescaling of variables which give rise to these multivariate polynomial, multivariate Bessel functions starting from Jack or McDonald's polynomials. Another way to think about these things is in terms of the Taylor series expansion. Again, it is uh, the simplest way to see it is in the n equals to one case, because in n equals to one case, when we have exponent, well, we know, everybody knows how to expand it in Taylor series. So exponent that is one plus az, az squared over two factorial, az cube over three factorial, etc. And again, these, uh, you know, Taylor series expansion has a generalization to any values of n. So you can expand this symmetric function in n variables in the basis of symmetric polynomial. That's the kind of expansion which you get. So it will be sum now over all young diagrams and there'll be some functions, p's and q's here. Don't have time to define them. These are versions of Jack polynomials. Uh, Jack polynomials and y. Are there two of those? Well, that's because there are two different normalizations of these Jack polynomials in two different normalizations. So, well, these normalizations, if you ever dealt with, if you were ever dealing with 
properties of symmetric function are always Cauchy identities and these Cauchy identities for maybe you know Jack or McDonald's polynomial there are always two kinds of polynomials with two different normalizations and these are exactly the same two kinds of polynomials we just you know kind of normalization by some norm which is different here so there is an expansion in this Jack polynomial somewhat explicit expansion and maybe you know the most straightforward you know, definition of these uh, uh, multivariate Bessel function that simultaneously the eigenfunction of certain very simple operators, which are so-called symmetric Dunkel operators. And what are these operators? So these are some kind of operator generalizing just differentiations. So you take derivative in ith variable, that's an easy operation, but then you deform it a little bit depending on your parameter beta. Namely, you add to it, you know, the following sum over all j's, one minus sij operator divided by zi minus zj. And what is this sij operator? This swaps, swaps i and j variable. So you take a function, two variables, and you just interchange these variables. And now the claim is that... But in, uh, so there's a question, a comment from Michael. Can you take a look? Formula looks like you acted on cache identity with an operator. Yeah, I, so, the, uh... I agree, I agree. This looks... Uh, yeah, it looks a little bit like that. I, I agree with this remark. I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say to that, but I, I don't know. You know, it's kind of a question about how do you move between three definitions. I'm telling you that okay, there are, you know, there is a definition through operator. There is definition through these, you know. Corners process. There is definition between in in terms of these, you know, expansion. You know, I don't know particularly easy way to move between these three definitions. So you do need to develop quite a lot of theories. So in this way, I'm also, uh, you know, can't give you easy explanation why that's true. So Yanis Tell is asking either partition function representation of B. Well, yes, that our, our original definition was partition function representation, right? Because, uh, you know, that was our definition. So this object is a partition function of, you know, these, triangular array of eigenvalues, uh, you know, whose distribution we had on the, on the first slide. So this is the law of this array. And in this law, you, you know, insert some kind of additional, you know, inhomogeneity here, because, you know, that's uh, the expectation with respect to this law. So in a sense, yes, there is, you know, partition function. So, you know, it is in the same, same partition function as, you know, you can think about McDonald polynomials or, you know, or maybe, you know, Jack polynomials, whatever you like, you know, as a partition function, because in fact, this is a limit of, this is a limit, you know, essentially this formula here, this is just a limit of combinatorial formula for the McDonald polynomials. So that's, you know, after several generations, that's how you can think about it. Uh, okay. Any more questions? Okay, so in terms of this Dunkel operator, that's what's happening. So you create symmetric expression out of this Dunkel operator because this Dunkel operator, it has nothing to do with symmetry at the beginning because it's it's not symmetric. But then you make it symmetric. So you consider power sums, or you can do any symmetrization you like, but power sum, these are ones which I particularly like. Compute uh, that's the power sum of these Dunkel operators. You act with this power sum on the multivariate Bessel function and claim it that you're getting, you know, eigenvalues. So these are eigenfunctions. Okay, so these are, you know, the properties of these Bessel functions. And in a sense, you know, if you know these properties, then in a sense, you don't need anything else. You can just use them as a black box. And at this point, you can just operate with these properties and prove whatever you want about these objects. You know, it's in a sense somewhat similar to how we, currently work with maybe trig trigonometric functions. You know, originally people needed to kind of prove all these things like Taylor series expansion and why derivative of sine is equal to cosine, et cetera. But once you have all of that, 
then you can just you know use these properties as a black box and you don't need anything else and you know similarly here so for this basic functions all you need you need these properties and then you can try to operate with those so let me try uh, you know checking this property is not easy again so you know even at bt equals to two for example there is no you know in, in the homework we will have you know some checks you know, for these properties, maybe, you know, for this eigenfunction of the dunkel operators, but even that is not completely obvious check. So, you know, there is a theory which underlies here all the things, and I'm kind of hiding this theory under the rug. Anyway, let's, let me try to demonstrate something easy out of that. So last time I was paying attention to BT goes to infinity limit. Let's now, for a change, take a look at what's happening with these mysterious operations of beta addition of random matrices as beta equal to zero. So beta will be tending to zero. What's happening? How do you add random matrices on the field of dimension zero? So that's a statement that uh, the operation turns out to be a very simple one. Namely, somehow, you know, all these invariants of eigenvectors turns into invariants under permutations by symmetric group. So somehow, you know, group of orthogonal unitary matrices at beta equals to zero becomes just symmetric group. So the statement is that the additional operation at beta equals to, zero, equals to zero looks as follows. So you take your A and B to n tuples of eigenvalues and you pick a uniformly random permutation and you say that C1 to Cn is a sums of A and Bs in which you reshuffled Bs according to this permutation. So you're kind of just adding, but you don't know the order, which one is the first one, which is the last one eigenvalue. So you need to reshuffle in all possible ways. So let's try to actually prove this theorem. So in order to prove it, we need to understand Bessel functions at bt equals to zero. So let us understand uh, bt equals to zero. Bessel functions. Okay, so we will just use properties here as a black box. So they should be symmetric. They should be symmetric. And they should satisfy the followed identity that sum i goes one to n d d z i raised to the power k times this Bessel function should be equal to the sum of a i to the k Bessel function z1 zn0. So that is because, you know, the Dunkel operators, which are quite complicated in general, but when beta, beta is equal to zero, you know, all this non-trivial part disappears and these are just operators of taking derivatives. So, you know, that's, you know, should be somehow eigenfunction of differentiation, but symmetric eigenfunction. So let's forget for, about the symmetry first. If you just take operator of differentiation, DDZ, so what are eigenfunctions of the operator of differentiation? Anybody in the audience knows? What functions are di diagonalized by derivatives? Let's put exponentials, exactly. <laughs> Perfect, yeah, exponentials. So, you know, here we need symmetric things. So we just need to symmetrize exponents and that's, uh, you know, that will give us the answer. So DDZ has exponents as eigenfunctions. So we need to symmetrize those. Symmetrize them. So, well, there is a statement that B A1 A N Z1 Z N zero is equal to certain constant multiplied by the sum over all permutations of product goes one to n e to the zi times a sigma of i. 
So, well, imagine that you're acting with this object on this guy. So, you know, you will have just powers of A popping out, right? Because you differentiate this thing with respect to each variable. You get, you know, these powers of A and you get all of those and that's why you're getting this identity. Okay, there is still some constant here. So what is constant? Can anybody guess maybe what is a constant comparing, you know, to all our previous definitions? Plug uh, Z equals zero. Right, yeah. Mario is correct. So if you plug Z, Z equals to zero, so if you go to our original definition, where was it here? So at z equals to zero, there's expectation of function one. So it should be equal to one. So this means that uh, constant is actually one over n factorial by plug-in zn equals to zero. Okay, good. So now we know these multivariate Bessel functions. So what does it mean? It means that uh, we can find our, bet, our addition at bt equals to zero through the following procedure. So c1 to cn is found through, so you need to have that expectation respect to c one over n factorial sum over permutations, let's call them sigma one of the product, i goes one to n e to the z i c sigma of i is equal to one over n factorial squared sum over sigma two and sigma three of what? So product, e to the z i a sigma two of i plus b sigma three of i. So I just took two of these functions and I multiply those. So n factorial is now twice present and I just multiply these products and that's what you say as you get. At this point it just rem uh, you know, remains to rename the permutations because that's, you know, you see that there is a, there are these sums of A's and B's to appear here. So, you know, you can just, you know, rename permutations and you get in the formulas, you know, which you have with sigmas here. Renaming sigma i, you get the theorem. Any questions about this argument? Uh, yeah, madam. Uh, madam why, why is it A plus B equal B plus A? Well, that's because multiplication is, 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 is like that, right? Because, you know, what was our, our definition here, right? So we were multiplying, you know, these two functions and this was really just commutative multiplication, right? So, you know, no matter in which, in which order you multiply two functions, you know, that's the same function, right? So this is kind of, you know, because of the fact that we are kind of ignoring information of eigenvectors. So we are kind of keeping this commutative part of the, you know, algebra of matrices somehow. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, not really about the argument, but uh, kind of more general <laughs> question. So in the case of beta equal two, as in the problem set two, mm -hmm. so this function becomes a determinant of similar expression, right? E to the power AI. Right. Yeah, so this is, this appears as a limit of shear function, I think, and this is kind of related to free fermion. Exactly, exactly, and yeah. Now, yeah, now we, we don't have the you know, sign, so mm -hmm. kind of uh, permanent, something like permanent, right? Right. Yeah, so this, this is more related to boson, but uh, kind of one part, sorry, maybe I'm kind of using uh, physical language, but uh, so the one particle problem are the same, right? For both, for three fermions, beta equal two and beta equal zero. Is there right. some kind of explanation about this uh, connection? 
like uh, why is it why is it at n equals to one all the same you know no matter with whether you work with fermions or bosons uh, well so sorry I'm, my question is a bit vague yeah uh, yeah i mean i you know i don't have good explanation frankly speaking it's also you know there is also certain duality here between beta hmm. equals to zero and infinity somehow so there is a, some operation of inverting beta and uh, you know, for example, and there is a very good theory at beta equals to infinity of Gaussian objects mm -hmm. here, which would be defined in terms of their covariance, which is like, you know, like, like bosons you can think, you can think about like Gaussian things are, are bosons. So, you know, both at zero and infinity, there are these, you know, these objects, which indeed I agree with you that these are bosons. I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't know what else to say mm. about it. I mean, you can also you can also th think about it. You know, if you think about beta ensembles, right? So, you mm. know, when you have this kind of van der Mond raised to the power beta, and if beta is equal to zero, then this van der Mond disappears, right? So, mm. kind of this repulsion, you know, which you expect to see in fermions, kind of disappears, right? Mm -hmm. And you kind of have mm -hmm. independent things, which kind of make you think that it's a little bit like boson. But you know, I don't have anything deeper really to say here. Okay, thank you. Okay, now let's go further. So, you know, one thing that you can just deduce as a corollary for this bit equals to zero computation, which we just did, is that you know you can express what we did computation in terms of the expected characteristic polynomial. Namely, since we know the law of these, uh, you know, of this sum, if you form product of Z minus C i, some kind of characteristic polynomial of the matrix, and if you take expectation of this characteristic polynomial, then it is equal to the sum over all permutations, one over n factorial times this thing. <clears throat> So this is just, you know, corollary of our theorem, right? I, I have not said anything here just because C's from our theorem, they're given by these sums and you just compute, you know, expectation of that through this summation over symmetric group. But now, you know, there is actually a very interesting observation here. Turns out that this identity, which is, you know, easy to prove at beta equals to zero, actually holds true, not only for beta equals to zero, but actually for all values of beta. So for beta equals one, for real matrices, for beta equals two, complex matrices, four quaternionic matrices, you no, know, any values of beta you like, exactly the same identity works in expectation. So somehow, you know, these expected characteristic polynomial, it is a thing which somehow does not feel, you know, anything about any value of beta, you know, although we had just discussion with Samahiro that, you know, it seems that the objects are very different at beta equals two and beta equals two zero, but at least, you know, there are some features of it which, you know, don't feel it. So this is kind of philosophically, this is kind of expected characteristic polynomial. Expectation or determinant of Z minus C. Okay, of course, you know, we don't have really, we don't really have matrix, but it is, you know, just philosophically this thing. So, you know, in particular, you can also send now beta to infinity here. So in beta goes to infinity, well, remember last time when we were sending beta to infinity, we had randomness disappearing, right? Instead of the cutting corners, now we had just eigenvalues or not eigenvalues, we had just roots of derivatives of polynomials. Similar pheno pheno phenomenon will happen here. So as beta goes to infinity, randomness will disappear and C's will become deterministic. So CI are deterministic, but they're still defined by the very same identity, which we had here. Only, you know, in this identity, you no longer need expectation because, you know, if you have deterministic thing that, you know, you don't need expectation, this is just a product of Z minus CIs. So, you know, in the limit beta to goes to infinity, you get another interesting operation on polynomials. Some kind of a version of addition of polynomials that you have two polynomials, one of them with roots A, another with, with roots B, and then you add these A and Bs in all possible ways and you average and somehow miraculously you get another polynomial. Like what is miraculous here is that, you know, you started from a 
you know, polynomial with real roots because all these A's and B's were real and you end up still with polynomial with real roots. That's why actually, you know, this kind of polynomial operations, they actually were, you know, people were interested in that already maybe 100 years ago because people wanted to investigate operations which preserve property of a polynomial be real rooted. But here we see this kind of operation as just a limit of this addition of random matrices. So I don't know what is more, you know, surprising linked to this operation or the fact that this identity, you know, does not depend on beta. And just, you know, I can give you a brief, I don't have time unfortunately to give you full proof of this beta independence, but just, you know, maybe for the specialists, just some hints on the proof. Why is it true that the identity does not depend on beta? Well, that's because, you know, remember that we had these Taylor series expansions of Bessel functions in terms of Jack polynomials. So you can use these Taylor series expansion to find certain expressions for the expectations of Jack polynomials in eigenvalues. So this is using, using Taylor series for Bessel functions. Well, and then, you know, once you expand it in Jack polynomials, you notice that there is an interesting property of the Jack polynomials. In principle, these are symmetric polynomials which are parameterized by partitions, but for special partitions, which are one column partitions, actually these symmetric polynomials simplify dramatically and they become just elementary symmetric functions. In particular, they don't depend in any way on the value of beta. On the other hand, you know, these elementary symmetric functions, that's precisely the objects which we need because, you know, EK, that's just precisely coefficient. So if you expand these, uh, you know, characteristic polynomial using, I don't know, the of formulas or whatever you want, uh, then, you know, coefficient, you know, of Z to the N minus K, that's precisely the metric symmetric function in C's. So we actually kind of, you know, in a hidden way, computing expectations of elementary symmetric function. And the, because of these elementary symmetric functions being beta independent, that's a technical reason why, you know, this characteristic polynomial ends up you know, being uh, beta independent. <clears throat> okay, so that's about this, you know, expected characteristic polynomial, which turns out to be an interesting and simple enough object in this theorem. So let me again, like in previous lecture, end with asymptotic result, because, you know, as before, eventually we want matrices to be large. You know, in this class, I don't really have time to discuss in details how do you deal with large matrices. But, you know, at least I can state a theorem for you. So asymptotic result is about, you know, again, limit of this addition of matrices and the result, you know, is stated as follows. So suppose that you have, you know, now very large matrix. So you have N tuple eigenvalues of this very large matrix. And you can assume that this N tuple somehow regularly depends on N, namely that the empirical measure of this N tuple converges to some probability measure, let's call it mu A. And then, you know, you assume that for the second matrix, you kind of have the same, that the empirical measure converge, you know, to another probability distribution, let's call it mu B. Then you can encode these two probability distributions, you know, through their cauchy stitcher transforms. Then you do this summation operation, C is equal A plus B, you know, you can do it for any value of B. And then the statement that resulting object, about which by the way, you know, we don't know positivity as I told you, conjecture is positive, but you know, we don't know rigorously, but at least in the limit N2 goes to infinity, we know that it's positive because somehow, you know, we end up with operation which will, you know, not dependent on beta, so we can use our knowledge about beta one, two, and four here. Namely, you know, the statement is that, you know, for the sum empirical distribution of eigenvalues again converges to the measure, which you can again encode in, in, in terms of its uh, cauchy stitcher transform. And then, you know, one way to think about this operation is that if you consider, you know, integral transform, the same one as in the last lecture, you know, this uh, Vicolesco R transform, which is inverse stitcher transform minus one over Z, then this object is, you know, linearizes your operation. So this R transform of mu C, some of the R transform of mu A and R transform of mu B. And that's why, you know, not, not that's why, but you know, the name for this operation, which we obtain in this way, that is a free convolution 
of probability measure of probability measures from free probability theory of mu a and mu b. Now, some comments are you know important here. So this result holds for any fixed value of beta. Well, I'm lying a little bit, so it's not really written down. So I think that it's written down, written down for beta equals one, two, and four. But there are tools in the literature to prove it, you know, for any values of beta somehow just, you know, people, well, including myself, so I need to apologize for that. We are just lazy enough that, you know, we never wrote down this statement for all values of beta, but it's, it's valid for all values of beta. But, you know, these values of beta need to be taken positive because at beta equals to zero, you know, this operation, which, uh, which is here, this operation is very different. This operation is somehow close relative of just usual addition of random variables. And that's why, you know, eventually in the limit and at beta equals zero, you get uh, just ordinary convolution. So usual, uh, usual convolution. So that's just an operation that we started from when you have two random variables, two independent random variables, and you add them and you see what's, what's the effect on the distributions. So usual convolution of uh, of measures so you know there is some discontinuity here that at positive beta you know you get this free convolution because if beta equals to zero you get your usual usual convolution and that's why actually there is an intermediate regime as usually happens if you have discontinuity then you try to zoom in and you can try to find uh, you know what is it like interpolation between these two operations so there is a critical regime when actually as the size of the matrix go, grows your parameter beta should go to zero so that the product beta n beta times n converges to a constant gamma and there is sort of an operation there which interpolates between you know ordinary convolution and free convolution Unfortunately, I'm kind of out of time, so I don't have to time to really speak about this operation here. But if you're interested, again, I will speak about that in this you know, conference in Marseille in two weeks, which I was advertising yesterday. But for my talk today, that's it. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for, again, for a very nice lecture.